Okay, good morning, Astronomy 1020. Welcome to our fourth week of lecture. We are going to continue cleaning up the scraps of Newton's laws, the law of gravity, and orbital dynamics that'll take up a part of today. Maybe do a little escape velocity. And I'd like to start making a transition out of the book's chapter four on gravity and Newton's laws. And I'd like to make a transition into chapter five, which deals with energy, atoms, light, temperature, matter. So all those things will be the subject of this week's lecture. If I were good enough to do a chapter per week, then last week would have been chapter four and this week would start chapter five. But the reality is that I, especially with all the calculator time, I need some extra time to cover bits of chapter four and bits of chapter five. So as I was telling you guys before the recording started, today's lecture is gonna be miscellaneous bits of physics that you need to know. Um, we'll definitely build in some time to do some practice problems because an exam will be coming up in a week or two, right? And you will be doing these things on the exam. I'm sure that's terrifying at this point, but you guys will be trained. Um, today's lab, you don't need any special equipment for. We're basically gonna be doing a glorified homework problem but we're gonna be doing it slowly and carefully. Uh, and it's gonna be more practice using Newton's version of Kepler's third law. I have a quick question. Hit me. Um, I took your class last semester. So before we took the exam, you went over practice problems. Will you do that again for this semester? Did you, find that helpful? did you find that helpful? Yeah. yeah. Cause we did it the day before. And then when I took the exam, I remembered the day before what we did. So it did help me. Versus well, like taking problems a month ago and me like blanking. That makes sense. I forgot that you had taken the other class because I never see your face, Kelly. <laughs> okay, so anyways, um, but yes, that's a good idea. Uh, let me let me share screen and let's see if I built that in. I do believe in the syllabus. You know, now that I'm kind of. <clears throat> walking us through the show every day in the AS 1020 schedule, you'll notice, uh, what is today? Today is February 9th. So here we are. We're supposed to be starting atoms and light, but we're going to be cleaning up this lecture and getting into that lecture. And then we'll have a couple of weeks of light. We actually might start to drift behind. You'll notice Kelly right here, I built in a week where instead of a normal homework, I let us off the hook for homework that week just so we could do those practice problems that you found so helpful for the exam. So, yeah, so it will be like a normal office hours, except instead of it for being the purpose of homework, it'll be the purpose of doing sample problems that will be quite similar to the ones you will face. So if anything, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm glad to know that it was helpful. Okay, so that that's good news. That means, hey, that that worked for you last time, and I bet these other people will really appreciate that too. But going by too fast for me. Say that, Sabrina. I was going by too fast. I know. Well, that's the way it works. You know, this choo-choo trip. -choo it also makes you realize, you know, uh, I shouldn't be waxing poetic on valuable class time here, but I tried to teach myself at one point uh, general relativity, and I had this famous textbook on it, it's floating around here. It's called the, the Green Shoots book. And I remember sitting by myself for a whole summer and reading like chapter one casually and chapter two. I remember I took the class at, at Brown and in one week we covered what I had been doing all summer. So you kind of need a little team master to just keep whipping you like, like sled dogs in the Iditarod. You need a little guy whipping you and then you realize how much you can do if you push hard. So. So uh, that's my job, to see how hard we can push. Um, one other announcement, oh my gosh, I really need to make this. Having graded all your papers on Sunday, people have been turning in homework number th three in the slot for homework number four. People have been turning in lab number two in the slot for lab number three. And do you know what I'm gonna do if you do that? I'm gonna give you a zero, okay? I can, because the punishment needs to be harsh. I cannot have this shit where people just turn in freaking assignments into any old slot. With so many of you, 
my life would completely disintegrate. I won't even be able to keep track of you all. Guys, there's a reason that every time we start a homework or a lab together, I make you write homework number three on it so that when you go to take the picture, you'll see. I mean, some people literally had the top of their thing, homework three, and I found it in the homework four slot. I was like, no. And I unfortunately had to give those people zeros in the hopes that they would pay attention and come cry to me and then beg me to fix it. But I'm worried that people don't pay attention even to like what's going on in their grade book. So you guys need to occasionally go and check that thing and make sure that stuff is getting graded appropriately the way you intended it to, okay? So that's, that's wicked important. Anyways, I wanted to say that at the beginning of the class because I know people tend to phase out on me as we go. All right, enough talk, more rock. Let's get into it and do it. Let's talk about the works of Isaac Newton just a little bit more. As you guys remember, um, uh, Newton gave us two different concepts. He gave us his laws of motion. And of course, of his three laws of motion, it is the second law that is the most mind-bogglingly useful. It's the formula that says force is equal to mass times acceleration. You really cannot overemphasize how powerful a formula this little simple thing is. You can unpack it a million different ways. You can learn so much about the universe. Um, and he also gave us the law of gravitation. We studied that in extreme detail last week. And we learned how to compute the force of gravity between two objects. Guys, I need to fix the glare. Sorry. It's possible to combine these things. You can combine the laws of motion and the law of gravitation in ways that let you discover new truths about the universe. And I wanted to do a demonstration of that. Of course, what we really want to do with the laws of motion and laws of gravity is we want to put these formulas together, do a bunch of crazy math, and you'll remember we wanted to rederive Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The problem is doing those problems requires a bit of mathematics that's just a little bit above our pay grade here in this course, and it does take a while to do that. That's like a week-long project. Rather than try to attempt that, there's a simpler, cheesier problem that we can do that will at least give you the sense of how you could combine this equation and that equation and discover something new, actually discover something old about the universe. So without further ado, let's just try a little sample cartoon problem together, okay? A problem that might have interested Sir Isaac Newton, that of an apple falling from an apple tree. So follow along with me, leave yourself some headroom, and let's draw planet Earth. And let's draw the radius of Earth in a vertical sense, because we're going to be looking at an apple tree and we want to compare it to the radius of Earth. The radius of Earth, you might remember, is 6,400 kilometers. And now let's put a little apple tree standing in a apple orchard in Woolsthorpe, England. And we're going to draw a little apple that's about to fall off a branch and uh, plummet down to the earth due to gravity. And gravity is going to be pulling this apple down to the ground. Same thing that inspired Isaac to develop this law of gravitation. You'll remember he realized that the same force pulling the apple to the ground must be the same force that holds the moon in its circular orbit. Now, this is a perfect job for both of these formulas together. Let's talk about our goal. The goal is to find the acceleration 
of the apple as it falls to earth? Does anybody know the answer? I just want to see who's like really on their toes. Does anyone know the answer to this question without doing the computation? Okay. Well, good thing we've got Newton's laws here. <clears throat> and let's talk about why we, we need these two laws. I can imagine computing, uh, by the way, let's add some numbers here. In this case, students, what is M1 and what is M2 going to be? Help me think. What does M1 represent and what does M2 represent? Mass one and mass two. Yeah. What are the two masses that are attracting each other here? Maybe my question isn't, isn't being phrased properly. M1 and M2 are generic masses. They could be any old masses. In this case, we're investigating specific masses. I want to make sure that you guys can make the mental leap to know that M1 is hmm hmm and M2 is hmm hmm. Can you do that for me? Is M1 the apple, the mass of the apple? Sure. And what would M2 be then, Kiana? Oh um, what is the apple being attracted to? What's the ground? Okay, but you know, think a little bigger than the ground. The earth. The earth. Yeah, the freaking earth. Yeah, the earth. Okay, Jesus, guys, you're scaring me. Okay, I thought that would be obvious. I'm glad I asked that question. Okay, um, so the mass of Earth, let's write it down here, is six times ten to the twenty-four kilograms, and I think the mass of a typical apple, I'll make it lowercase m, is probably about two hundred grams. That's what I think the mass of an apple is. I think I've got an apple, but it might be squishy. This is an old apple. I, I didn't eat it, so it's a little wrinkly, but here's a kilogram. Maybe, maybe two, two tenths. Sure, 200 grams. Okay. We know what big G is. Oh, what are we going to use for the distance between the apple and the earth? How tall would you say a typical apple tree is? Do apple trees get as tall as pine trees? Probably like 12 feet tall. Huh? 12 feet. 12 feet. So that's double the height of me and I'm about two meters. So maybe four meters, right? Okay. So the height of our apple tree is about four meters. What do you think we should choose for the distance between the apple and the earth? I should try to go a little quicker here. What should, I know what M2 is going to be. M2 is going to be the mass of earth. I know what M1 is going to be. M1 is going to be the mass of the apple. I know big G. Uh, we, we know that big G is always the same number, seven times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared. The only thing we have left to do is figure out what's the distance between the apple and the earth. Why is don't it you that guys- 64,000? Say that again, Kiana? Is it the 64,000? Is that 64,000? Did you say that right? No, I mean 6,400. I'm sorry, I'm slow that's, today. That's okay. Does, oh, you're, are you sick? No, I'm just, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm just having a slow day. That's okay. I had, I had one of those yesterday. It wasn't pretty. Okay. Um, so that's good, Kiana. What about the four meters? Do we need to worry about that? Um, Kiana. I feel like it's kind of important, but. Well, let's figure out how many meters we got here. What is the, where's the apple being attracted to, right? The apple is attracted to earth. Yes. You will remember that when I told you about the law of gravity, I told you it was a center to center attraction. 
one of the things that Aristotle had correctly deduced about gravitation is all objects are attracted to a point at the center of Earth. Because if you add up all the little bits of rock that make up the Earth, they all act as if they're concentrating their gravity right at the center. Everything falls towards the center of Earth. Mm -hmm. So another way to look at it is when I defined the law of gravitation, I showed you the formula and I went through great pains to say, hey, in this formula, D, the distance, is the, is the gravity between the centers of the two objects, right? Mm -hmm. So I can mean from the center of the apple to the center of Earth. It's not just, you know, from the surface to the surface. It's the distance from the center of planet one to the center of planet two. And that holds even if planet two happens to be an apple and planet one happens to be Earth, okay? So, Kiana, I need your help really quick. I don't like the fact that the height of the apple is four meters and the radius of Earth is 6,400 kilometers. That's all mixy matchy, not lining up together. We need to we need to get these things in the same units. Let's put this into meters because you'll remember that this distance needs to be in meters for the MKS units. Okay. So what do I do, uh, Kiana? Where's your face? I lost you. There you are. Okay. I know you have oh, a two-dimensional analysis here. Oh, let me look at my notes really quick. I don't want you guys, look, you can't be thinking about dimensional analysis anymore. You can't be like, oh, wait, well, how does that work? You need to just fucking do it. So we need to keep doing this and doing this until you're smooth, okay? So 6,400 kilometers, go. Get your steps out if you need to. Okay, if I call it a lifeline while I look, because I don't want to sit and hold the video while I look. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, okay, does anybody know how to do dimensional analysis? If not, then see, we can only go as fast as you guys can handle, right? We can't go faster than that because then you just won't be following me. But you said dimensional analysis. Yeah, Andy, you want to you want to take us through that one? Yeah. So all right. So we have to convert the, the uh, six thousand four hundred. So kilometers. we're gonna, kilometers. So we're gonna times that, Five and then bar. division bar, and then we're gonna have the kilometers at the bottom and the meters on top. And that would be one meter, a thousand kilometers. Okay. And then you're gonna cancel out your kilometers. Okay. And then. It is, and you gotta calculate. So, oh, there's my calculator. So, what is it? 6,400 times 1,000. What does the kids do here? What? So, this one would be 6.4 meters. So, the, the radius of Earth is 6.4 meters. And I'm about two meters tall. That would mean the radius of Earth is just three of me stacked on top of each other, right? Guys, an important mistake has been made. It didn't seem like anyone was catching it, but we got to talk about that. It's 6.4 times 10 to the 6. Okay, right. But back up a step, Mateus, so they understand that. What's the, what's the thing that was done wrong? Uh, he, I think he rounded it up, but he forgot to add the, the no, so time. This is not about rounding. This is about dimensional analysis. It's, it's supposed to be 1,000 meters equals one kilometer. Do you see this? I'm glad that Andy made that mistake because he will not be the only person to make this mistake come test time. It's so easy to screw that up. He put the 1,000 with the kilometers in the one with the meter. One meter is not a thousand kilometers. I, I let it play out just to make this point. Look, one kilometer is a thousand meters. Don't you see? It's so easy to make that mistake. Anybody could make that mistake. How do you not make that mistake? When you have your conversion factor, one kilometer is equal to a thousand meters, that should be written down somewhere. You make sure you keep each number with its units. 
The thousand must stick to the meter. The one must stick to the kilometer. This is why we do units first and number second, okay? As long as your units are canceling, you can't screw this up unless you do what Andy did. <laughs> Anyways, Andy, it's okay. Everybody makes this mistake sooner or later. We, we, it was better that we talked about it as a class. Did I lose Andy? Oh, there, okay. I'm so sorry, don't worry I'm about sorry. it. All right, so Mateus, what did you say the uh, final number is gonna be? So 6.4 times 10 to the six yeah. meters. You'll notice he didn't really need to use a calculator because he saw three zeros there, four, five, and the decimal point is after the four, so that's the sixth power, okay? Okay, geez, Louise, now that we've spent 10 minutes converting kilometers into meters, maybe we can get back to the point of the problem. Um, Kiana, how does the radius of Earth, 6.4 million meters, compare to the height of an apple tree? I muted my bad. What do you mean? How does it compare to it? I mean, should we add the two numbers together? I, you know what? Why don't you do it? Guys, add 6.4 times 10 to the 6 plus 4 meters. Tell me what you get. That's what I got. So what do you want to round that to? I'm just playing games with you guys. I don't even think. Wouldn't change. I would leave it at the. I'm like making a joke. At the difference is just negligible. You don't even yeah. really need yeah, to change it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. guys. Four bucks out of six point four million bucks. Who cares? The height of the apple tree doesn't matter in this problem. Basically, what I'm saying is the distance here is just the radius of Earth. And I really wanted to say that right away, but I wanted to make you guys stumble around and think about it. Clearly, we needed to think about it. The radius of Earth is the distance between those. Uh, so this is the radius of Earth. Um, I'm going to use capital M for the mass of Earth. Since the apple is like a little mass, you know, it's only this in comparison to the Earth, right? This is a nasty little apple. Um, I'm, I'm just going to use little m, and I'm going to make it red, just like a Macintosh. I'm going to use little m for the mass of the apple. <clears throat> OK. This equation tells me the force of gravity between the apple and Earth based on big G, the mass of the apple, the mass of Earth, and the radius of Earth squared. But I want to find the acceleration. How can I do that? Now I've got to use Newton's generic force law. This says if I know the force of gravity between them, I can find the acceleration that the mass of the apple will experience. And here I want to point out that we could have asked F equals MA for the Earth or F equals MA for the apple. We chose to think about the acceleration on the apple. Believe it or not, this is going to sound screwy, but if I were to drop this apple, which I can't do because it's so mushy that it would splat on my floor, okay? If I were to drop this apple down to the ground, there is truth to the fact that there would be a small tug on Earth from the apple and the Earth would move by just maybe one or two atom diameters in the direction of the apple. The Earth and the apple attract each other. So there's an acceleration on the apple, and there's technically an acceleration on Earth. But Earth's mass is so great that the, it doesn't feel the acceleration much. Uh, the acceleration is mostly felt by the apple. So in other words, here I'm going to consider the force on the apple is the mass of the apple times the acceleration on the apple. And now what I can do is because the force of gravity is causing the apple to move, I can equate these two things. This force is that force. And I can write mass of apple times acceleration of apple is equal to big G times the mass of the apple times the mass of the earth divided by the radius of the earth squared. And now, some really beautiful magic happens. The mass of the apple appears on both sides of the equation. So I can cancel them out, good old fashioned algebra style. And I've now discovered a new truth about nature that the acceleration the apple will feel is big G times the mass of the earth 
divided by the radius of the Earth squared. And one of the points of this is to say, holy cow, the acceleration that the apple feels does not depend upon any property of the apple, neither its mass nor its size. And that suggests that not only will this apple have some acceleration, but it wouldn't matter if it was a Macintosh or a Granny Smith or a Fiji, a Fuji apple or whatever the hell is your favorite brand of apple. Hell, it wouldn't even matter if this was a pine cone or a snowflake or a dump truck. All objects accelerate to Earth at the same, well, I don't wanna say rate, at the same acceleration. And it only depends upon the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth. Why don't we go ahead and compute that number just for funsies, okay? So I'll go back up here. I'll leave that down there. I'll make myself a little bit of room. And we will discover that the acceleration of the apple is big G. I know that big G is seven times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared times the mass of the earth six times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And remember the radius of earth has to be in meters. So I'll use the value that um, Andy and uh, Mateus helped us get, 6.4 million, doing all my units in red, meters squared. Okay, now quick like a bunny, I need you to punch this up and I need to speed up this stuff here. We're going kind of slow today. Apparently, Kiana, you're not the only one who's slow. Our entire class is slow. Punch them up. Okay, what you got? Okay, Mateus, give it to me straight, you know? Don't, uh, don't make me work for it. Is it 10.25? Whoa, four sig figs? What are you, uh, Large Hadron Collider technician over there? I don't think you deserve four sig figs. I don't know where, maybe it just felt good because it felt like you were doing money or something. That's the thing. Everyone wants to put the dollars and cents in. That's not how it works. You have to put the number of sig figs that are appropriate to our input, which is like one. <laughs> so maybe. 10? 10. 10 what though, Mateus? I was less interested in the rounding. Oh, I guess I'm interested in the rounding now that I know. Meters per second? Uh, try better. Meters per second squared. That's right. And uh, Mateus, let's look at how that happened. Meters squared cancel two of the three meters. And that leaves us uh, with one meter, right? So two of the meters cancel with three of the meters. The kilogram cancels with the kilogram. And you have one meter on the top and second square on the bottom of the top, which is the bottom, 10 meters per second squared. Doesn't this sound familiar, Mateus? This reminds me of a number we've seen before. Who has a good memory and remembers where this came up before? I felt like that number has came up before. Yeah, it's in your notes somewhere. I actually yeah. told you there's a special name for this. That's why I asked at the beginning, does anyone know what the answer is going to be? Because I wanted to see if you guys could remember anything I said ever. Oops. Is it the gravitational force? Not the gravitational force. Yeah, maybe like the general force of gravity. It's not a force, it's an acceleration. I have it. I think I have it. Okay. Um, 
is it units of acceleration? Well, part of that lesson was to teach you the units of acceleration, but this thing has a name. Little g. It's little g. Oh, and I'm going to put it in like, wow, it's literally little g. Yeah, this isn't, this isn't any old arbitrary acceleration. This is a famous acceleration. Let me tell you how to say it. This is what I wanted to hear. This is the local acceleration of Earth's gravity. Sometimes people try to say something silly like it's gravity, but it's not gravity. Gravity is a force. This is the acceleration due to the gravity of a unique body, which is our dear beloved planet Earth. Uh, little g would not be the same on Mars, nor would it be the same on Jupiter. But on Earth, because the mass of the apple cancels out, anywhere you go on Earth, the acceleration that anything feels, you know, like if I drop this eraser, is only dependent upon big G, a constant that's tuned into the universe, the mass of the planet and the radius of the planet squared. You will remember that one of the demonstrations of this is when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Well, first of all, before I show you the Neil Armstrong thing, who discovered this? Well, Newton did not discover this. Somebody else did. Who was that somebody? Can you remember? Who discovered little g? Was it Kepler? Not Kepler. He was the planetary motion guy, the laws of planetary motion. Maybe I need to give you a hint. Can I give you a hint? Who discovered little g? Uh, here's my hint. Does this ring any bells? Slide 11? Newton? It wasn't Newton. Shoot. Isaac. Who was it? Isaac. Nope. Isaac Newton did not. Galileo. This was Galileo. I had the little museum of Galileo. The I was trying to cover it with your faces. Okay. By the way, does it cover? It doesn't cover it for you guys. It just covered it for me, for the video people. Okay. Um, damn it. Galileo, guys, we didn't talk too much about it. Remember he built this inclined plane? I don't know if you guys are fully understanding my point. What is the value of what Newton did? Galileo had already discovered that the acceleration of Earth was 10 meters per second squared because he rolled, he rolled some spheres down an inclined plane. And by timing the, the rate at which they rolled, he was able to deduce little g. So what's the point of Newton doing it again? Why did we do all this math? Was this just an exercise in math? Or, or was there some point to this? What do you think? I'm just curious to see if, if we've gotten something from our work. I think this is like the math version of that experiment that he did. Okay, so that's one way to look at it, Mateus. And I want you to stick with that for a second. Mateus said, well, this is the math version because what, what Galileo did wasn't really the math version. He didn't do any equations. He just kind of built this beautiful little machine and he rolled the spheres down and based on the rate that they tinkled, that's how he calculated little g. Or he met, he didn't really calculate it, he measured it directly, right? Newton, on the other hand, did not build an inclined plane, did he? He didn't have to get any sawdust in his fingernails or t bust out the brush and the varnish. He didn't even have to roll any spheres down the thing. He just had to like do some math as Matthias put it. But I would argue that there's something extra that comes out of here. Remember, the whole point of this was to say there are ways that you can combine the laws of motion with the laws of gravity to discover a new truth. Matthias, suppose we went to Mars and we wanted to measure little g on Mars. We would have two options now of how to go about it, correct? One option would be to steal the inclined plane from the Museum of Galileo, take it on a rocket ship, and then once we got to Mars, roll some spheres down it and see what happened. Another option would be to take this formula, which this is a famous formula, which is like calculating the acceleration on any planet, right? If I remove the Earth, you can take the mass of the planet and the radius of the planet, and you can calculate your weight on Mars or your weight on the moon based on the difference between little g here and little g there, right?
But how do you find out the big G, the, the one uh, in the formula there? Remember, from Cavendish, we didn't have to find big G, Mateus. Obviously, if we had to do everything from start, if we were just given a spear and a rock and a box of matches, we would have a long way to go to build up civilization all over again. But remember, in our lecture last time, Mateus, I don't know if you remember, but well, I for Mars. Oh, oh, you're missing the point there, Mateus. Big G is the universal gravitational constant. This number is the same everywhere throughout the universe, whether it's Earth or Mars or a quasar at the edge of the galaxy. In fact, that's what's kind of cool about this. This is truly a constant of nature. This number, as far as we know, and people have really tried to investigate it, Mateus, as far as we know, this number is the same all throughout the universe. It's part of the machinery of the universe itself. We call them fundamental constants of nature. In fact, Mateus, we don't really need to make it a variable because it doesn't change, but people have decided that it's way easier to write big G than it is to constantly write seven times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared. You know what I mean? Like TLDR. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> So it's, this, is a, this is a constant, not a variable. That's important. Here in this equation, these are variables. They change from planet to planet. That does not. OK, I'm beating that to death. Um, this illustrates the difference between the two types of scientists that we find in nature, as if they were turtles on the Galapagos or something. Um, in nature, we find two different types of physicists. There are physicists like Galileo who investigate nature by building machines. And Galileo is an example of what we would call an experimentalist. These are good things to know about. On the other hand, you have someone like Newton who, as Matthias said, does the math instead he is someone called a theorist. A theorist can discover truths about nature just by doing math. An experimentalist can discover truths about nature by building machines and making things crash together or looking through telescopes. By the way, in astronomy, there's slight nuances. In astronomy, experimentalists are sometimes called observationalists. Uh, there are people who actually look through the telescope to collect data. And the theorist is sometimes also called, um, they call them computationalists because today people don't always do the, uh, the math out with a pencil and paper. Some do, but that's very rare. Most times they actually code the math into computer stuff. So theorist is sometimes the same as a computationalist. Most theorists today, they actually make models on their computer of dynamical situations. This is important because these two types of scientists are both necessary. Here's the thing, Mateus. I am only going to object to one thing that you said. When you said we're doing the math version, it almost made it sound like the two things were the same. I mean, they definitely discovered the same number, right? But it's not the same because each of these people have slightly different insights into the problem. As I mentioned, Galileo would have to take his inclined plane to Mars and roll the spheres down the ramp. The good thing about that, Mateus, is you can really trust your result because seeing is believing and you're seeing the rate at which the balls fall down to the planet, right? On the other hand, whereas a theorist can make mistakes in their math, as we often do, and go wrong, if they do pull it off and they do do it right, Newton discovered something a little bit extra and the little bit extra that Newton discovered is that not only is Earth's little g 10 meters per second squared, but he now knows that little g only depends upon the mass of the planet and the radius of the planet and not on any one particular object that's falling. Galileo knew this too, because he realized that whether he rolled a steel ball or a wooden ball or a lead ball, they all accelerated at the same uh, acceleration. I, I don't want to use the word rate because rate is a velocity, okay? They all fall to Earth with the same acceleration regardless of their mass. Most people don't notice this because air friction can be different for something like a feather or a hammer. And to demonstrate this, I almost hate to burn this class time, but you guys might find this interesting. 
I don't know if you remember this, but in the 1969 moon landing, YouTube uh, Armstrong Hammer and Feather. It's a pretty grainy video, uh, but but I think this is only like one minute and and maybe. Uh, Cam, we copied a both solar wind and uh, penetrometer drum in the ETB. Can I go any higher? Not quite yet. I haven't put the solar wind in yet, but I will shortly. I want to watch this. Okay. Yeah, he's just, he's just the jumping the around in the moon and having a grand old time. He's just jumping around the moon. <laughs> well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon? And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. Whee. How okay. about that? Uh, you know what blew my mind about that? Just watching that, realizing these guys are, are doing one of the most important scientific missions uh, of humanity, they're the first humans to watch and to land on the moon, right? And it's probably scary as hell, and they're worried about not getting back home to Earth. And they took time to do a little one-minute basic physics lesson, a la Astronomy 1020. That's like kind of amazing, right? Like that was worth it for them to like kind of do this fun demo for kids and students and teachers. Just a classy move and uh, and pretty wild. So, anyways, I wanted to show that to you to really drive home how important this result was. But also just to kind of say, this is an example of how we can discover a new truth by reevaluating somebody else's work with Newton's equations, or as Matthias said, the math version. With that in mind, it's now time to take another peek at Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Those are going to be testable, and I want to really go through how Newton reevaluated them. Okay, this section of your notes is a module very similar to what we just did, except I'm not gonna do as much of the math details. And it's called Newton's version of Kepler's uh, laws. And remember, these are Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. I already talked about this last class. I'm doing it again because it's that important. Now we're going to look at all three laws. Class, why don't you take out your notes and help remind me what is Kepler's first law of planetary motion? These are things you'll be tested on, of course. The law of ellipses. Yeah. And how did that go? A planet orbits around the sun of an ellipse with the sun located at the focus point. Good. And and just to give a visual to go along with that, because I believe that helps helps me anyways. Um, this is the picture that Kepler originally had in mind. Remember that Kepler did not know that a force of gravity existed. He did not have the concept of force of gravity. He just thought of the planets going around the sun as if by magic or something like that, right? So Kepler couldn't conceive of anything except for planets going around the sun because that's the only thing that he had to compare it to. But Isaac Newton now realized that any two objects with mass, if you put them into space, would go into orbit around each other. And in fact, famously, he, he had observed the moons of, well, Galileo had actually observed the moons of Jupiter. Let's take another quick look at uh, my other notes here. Uh, one of the things I didn't tell you about Galileo, but it's kind of worth mentioning, Galileo was the first uh, scientist to ever build a telescope and use it for astronomical purposes. So Galileo was, uh, I don't know if I have a picture of his telescope here. Oops, sorry. 
Uh, of course I don't, that would be too convenient. But uh, one of the things that Galileo did with his telescope is he, he pointed it at the moon, uh, at, at the planet Jupiter. And if you do this with your own telescope, you discover that there are four little points of light that are orbiting around Jupiter. Galileo was the first person to discover that Jupiter had moons. And he was the first person to discover another orbiting system that orbited something besides the sun or Earth. Here's a page from Galileo's very own notebook showing him drawing the planet Jupiter and the little moons, which are now called the Galilean moons, as little stars that are orbiting back and forth each night, rotating around Jupiter. He actually wrote to Johannes Kepler and told Kepler about this. And Kepler said, could you try using my P squared equals A cubed law on the moons? Could you see if P squared is equal to A cubed? Because that would be really cool. And when Galileo measured their periods and measured their distances and squared and cubed it, it didn't work. And Galileo actually lost respect for Kepler and thought, oh man, you're not cool anymore. <laughs> of course, he needed the Newtonian version, which we call NK3. He didn't real, neither of them realized that. Here's the problem with Kepler's first law, which is the law of ellipses. It's now possible to have two objects, like two stars, each which have the same mass. And if M1 is equal to M2, you're in a little bit of a weird situation vis-a-vis -vis the orbit because Kepler really can't explain that. He's usually imagining that, that there will be a, a sun at the focus point and that there will be a planet on the ellipse. But how do you know who orbits whom if the two stars have equal mass? Would star one orbit star two on an ellipse with star two at the focus point? Or would instead uh, star two orbit star one on an ellipse with star one at the focus point? What do you guys think? If their two stars are equal in mass, how's the orbit going to work? What would you guess, Nick, if you had to make a guess? I'm saying I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. OK, fair. I mean, this is what Newton might have started off by saying, and he had to do the math to investigate it. What he discovered, Nick, is that they would, neither one of them would be at the focus point, but they would orbit a common center of mass. And the center of mass is sort of like, uh, let me show you a picture here. The center of mass changes depending on the masses of the two stars, 65. If star one and star two are equal in mass, the center of mass is right in the middle. So they'll both be on ellipses and the center of mass will be at a focus point. If star one is maybe four times the mass of star two, the center of mass will shift to one fourth the distance between the two planets or stars rather. So they'll both orbit the center of mass, but the center of mass will only be one fourth the distance between star one and star two. If star one had been 10 times as much, the center of mass would then move to one tenth the distance between the two planets. In the case of the sun and earth, this is actually still happening, but the sun is literally 1 million times more massive than the earth. So the center of, the center of mass of the earth sun system is 1 millionth the distance between earth and the sun. And remember that one AU is 150 million kilometers. So the center of mass of the Earth and the sun is 150 kilometers from the center of the sun. But the sun's radius is 700,000 kilometers. So literally the Earth and the sun are orbiting a point inside the belly of the sun, right? Basically, the sun is not actually, this is why Kepler's laws are not technically true. The sun is not located at a focus point. Do I have an animation of this? But the Earth is orbiting a point somewhere inside the belly of the sun on an ellipse. And the sun is actually orbiting a point inside the belly of the sun. The sun is actually wobbling due to gravitational attractions from the other planets. Most of the sun's wobble comes from Jupiter because Jupiter is the most massive planet. But all of the planets actually cause uh, the sun to wobble on their axes. You know, this is such an important thing in astronomy. We've since used that stellar wobble 
This is how we find planets outside of our solar system. We take big telescopes, we point them at the same star for like a week straight, and we wait to see if any of them do a little wobble. And if they do, we know that there must be planets there causing them to wobble. When I was you, when I was in Astronomy 101, the number of planets known for a fact to exist outside of our solar system was zero. Now, 20 years later, we've found and confirmed over 5,000 planets outside of our solar system. In fact, it's hard for you guys to understand that. When I was a student, people were still debating whether planets should even be common or rare. And I hope you guys understand the implication of that, right? If planets are rare, guess what's rare in addition to planets? Aliens, okay? So the fact that we found planets outside of our solar system is kind of like good news for the potential discovery of life, which is an interesting question if you ask me, right? Okay, so let's rewrite the law of ellipses Newton style. I am now going to call this NK1, meaning Newton's improvement on Kepler's first law. And it would be two objects orbit um, each other on an ellipse with the center of mass at a focus point. By the way, this is only half true. Newton made one other important discovery, not just about the center of mass being the focus point. He also discovered that there were other options besides ellipses. So let's use strike through. Let's cross out the word ellipse. And over the top of it, we're going to write conic section. I don't know if you guys remember the whole conic section lecture, but I told you that ellipses were one of a class of geometrical objects called conic sections. And that if you slice a cone in different ways, you can get a circle, an ellipse, a parabola, and a hyperbola. Newton also discovered that the laws of gravity would allow stars and planets to not only orbit on bound orbits like ellipses, but that it was also possible to do flybys where gravity would kind of deflect your orbit and then fling you out into deep space never to return. This is what is known in the common parlance as the gravitational slingshot. And we use it all the time to get uh, our spacecraft out to the outer solar system. And we speed them up for free by just sending them really close to Jupiter or Saturn and flinging them off and getting a little boost from the planet's gravity, which is kind of cool. So Newton discovered that you didn't just have to have bound orbits that go around forever and ever. You could even have these gravitational slingshots. And so that was also a cool improvement to Kepler's laws. He discovered more. There was way more to Kepler's laws, right? So conic sections are the new field. Mostly we're going to deal with circular orbits and ellipses, but it's worthwhile mentioning it. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about NK2. What was NK, what was Kepler's second law? Can you guys regurgitate that for me? I can give you a hint. Law of areas. Yeah, and could you read that for me? A planet sweeps out equal units of area in equal intervals of time. Okay. Unlike Kepler's first law, which definitely needed some improvement, it needed to add center of mass and conic sections. Newton discovered that the law of equal areas in equal times, as we put it, Newton discovered that it was 100% true that Kepler had indeed discovered something true about gravitational orbits. The planets, the stars, the moons, the asteroids, they all sweep out equal areas in equal times. 
But what he did is he could see now into the machinery under the hood of the car, and he discovered the reason that this was true. The reason is something called the conservation of angular momentum. Now, I'd really like to have a kid's break on the conservation of angular momentum, but I'm not sure if I have time. I have a half an hour and I have so much to do. Um, okay. Fine. Um, let's just knock it out. It's time for a kid's break, okay? Where it's time for you guys to learn about the laws of linear momentum and angular momentum. I want you guys to think of this as a mini game that we're about to go into here. Because I want to talk about NK3, but if I don't jam this in here now, I'll never get back to it. OK. You guys ever seen? This uh, executive office toy here. This is known, by yeah. the way, as New Newton's cradle. Um, hold on, let me get uh, a clay brick. Let's see if I can. <laughs> a little dusty. A friend gave this to me, and I'm kind of glad they did. Okay, so you you've seen how this works, right? It's a demonstration of linear momentum. Um, when you take the first mass, uh, oh, actually, you know what? I really should get my focus better here. Logitech capture. I can improve the quality of this, albeit somewhat lame, weak demo. Um, momentum, uh, the original scientists who discovered it, they, they thought of momentum as like a fluid that could transfer from one object into another object. They literally believed that, that that momentum was almost like some kind of dynamic life goo that could go from, from one object to another object. Let me see if I can adjust the camera here. So the way it works is you take one of these steel um, uh, ball bearings here, and you give it some potential energy, and you, you let it go. And <clears throat> its motion gets transferred as if by magic, like it was a ghost fluid, through the, the middle objects into the other one. And... And this, this motion, it's like a, a motion quality gets transferred from, from one of the steel ball bearings to the other. You can even kind of do it with two, which is cool. You can release two. And the momentum gets transferred back and forth. You can even do weird stuff like this, where you, you get the two to kind of bounce off of each other. It's kind of cool, too. Um, lots of fun little demos. When an object moves, it has a quality of motion, a kind of oomph called linear momentum. And this momentum can be transferred, as you just saw, from one object to another. Let's take up some board space and let's define that, because I think it's good to have this kind of thing in your notes. Can uh, I copy down the rest? I don't have the rest. Yeah, sure. Thing. That's cool. Why don't you take a moment to do that? You got to get you got to get this stuff. I'm going to rewrite the momentum stuff up here. You've got the top part, right, Andrew? Andrew? Let's assume he's got the top part. Okay. Okay. So this little sub uh, subject we're going to cover is linear momentum. I like to think of linear momentum and as sort of like the oomph of a moving object. Now that's entirely my definition. It's kind of cutesy, but I like it. So I'm gonna share it with you. The amount of oomph of a moving object, but it's actually a mathematical formula, just like force. Uh, by the way, for historical reasons, physicists have chosen to represent momentum with the letter P. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but I think it's because they used M for too many other things. So linear momentum P is defined as an object's mass times its velocity. I want you guys to notice that it looks kind of like the force equation that Newton invented, 
instead of mass times acceleration, it's mass times velocity. What people discovered about linear momentum is that not only could the momentum be transferred from one object to another, but that the momentum in a total system is conserved. In other words, um, this is what we call in physics a conserved quantity. In physics, conserved quantities are quanti quantities in which the total momentum of a system must always remain constant. And you guys could see that with the Newton's cradle. If I gave the first sphere some momentum by letting it go, if this comes to rest by smacking into its brothers here, in order for momentum to be conserved, it had to travel through the other three spheres and come out the other side so that momentum can never die. Why conserved quantities are important in physics is they kind of give you Nostradamus like wizard powers where you can predict the future of what will happen when things crash into each other. A conserved quantity gives you magical abilities to say, if two masses slam together, what will happen on the other end after they collide? And you know, people analyze car collisions with these skills and all kinds of stuff. Usually there are one of three scenarios for momentum. If you have two objects that have the same mass, if the first mass hits the second one, the first mass comes to rest and the second one goes into motion. Not only did we see that in uh, Newton's cradle, but think about a game of pool, right? You fire the cue ball at the eight ball, the cue ball stops and the eight ball begins to move because they have basically the same mass. Um, things get a little bit different when the masses are not equal. Uh, if you have the case of uh, like a bowling ball in a BB, okay? If a BB hits a bowling ball, blink, it usually just recoils off of it. All the momentum stays with the little guy. On the other hand, if a bowling ball hits a BB, the bowling ball usually kind of snow plows the BB and just carries it forward. So those are the most extreme cases. When the masses are equal, one stops, the other starts to move. And if the masses are really lopsided, you either get a snow plow or you get a recoil. And, and when there are in between cases, when the mass one is a little bit bigger, then they both kind of develop some fractional motion. It's, it's, it's different there. But you, you understand my point. My point is once you know about linear momentum, you can predict the future when things collide. Linear momentum is an important concept that's related to Newton's laws of motion. However, I'm not interested in teaching you about linear momentum. I'm interested in teaching you about its freaky brother, angular momentum. In physics, anytime we have a quantity like force or uh, momentum or something like that, in a rotational system, they develop weird quirks because rotation is actually quite complicated. Allow me to introduce a slightly different quantity when objects rotate, they begin to have what's called angular momentum. And for some reason, humans have decided that the variable to represent angular momentum should be letter L. You might think of it as the oomph of a rotating object. But here's where things start to get weird. So first of all, if you wanted to have a picture of angular momentum, I do have a nice little slide here. When it's usually introduced to you in a physics class for your first time, this is usually function F5. This is the picture that you see as the most generic setup for angular momentum. Imagine you had like a little particle on a string, like you were wick at the Ewok, whipping around one of those uh, slingshots, okay? The mass has a velocity, but it's constrained to move on an orbit with some radius r. They sometimes call this the moment arm, okay? So you're rotating in a circle. Angular momentum is defined as the linear momentum, mass times velocity times r, which is the radius of orbit.
or the moment arm. Sorry, I wrote that kind of small. Like linear momentum, angular momentum is a conserved quantity. And I would actually say this, oh, a touchy feely way to think about it is objects that rotate want to stay rotating and in the same direction. So this is how I think about it. I don't know if that's the best way to put it, but objects that rotate want to stay rotating and in the same direction. Probably no better demonstration of this exists than that of the bicycle wheel. One of the cool things about the bicycle wheel is the tire here has mats, okay? And the spokes are so thin that they almost have no mass. So this is the radius. The mass isn't just a particle, but now it's an entire, it's an entire uh, wheel with steel and, or aluminum and uh, rubber. And one of the weird things about linear, uh, about angular momentum is when you make a thing start to spin, the only good way to define its direction is to define the direction of spin. Now, this is going to sound weird. We define the direction of spin as pointing along the axis of the spin. Because you can't define it anywhere else because the tire is always pointing in a different direction as it rotates around. But the one direction that stays fixed is the axis of rotation. So we define the axis as the direction of momentum. Once I give, now this bicycle wheel happens to be dangling from a string. And when it's not rotating and I hold the string, gravity just flops over the bicycle wheel, right? That's what it does. But watch what happens if I give the bicycle wheel some angular momentum. Here we go. I can now hold it by the string and gravity is unable to pull over the tire. That's because of the conservation of angular momentum. Watch this. I can even try to knock it over. I can't do it. Even if I give this thing a whack. In fact, I can almost practically. Now, do you guys see this gyro motion that's undergoing here? This is called precession. What's happening is gravity is trying to pull the wheel over and down. The concept angular momentum says, F you, I don't want to fall over. But the, the trade-off is that it ends up rotating and spinning around in a circle. It's called precession. Um, this is the principle of a gyroscope. This is why you don't fall over on your bicycle when it's rolling, when you're moving. Think about it. On your bike, if you stop, you fall over. But once the bike is in motion, you stay aloft. You know what's keeping you up? Not your balance. It's the conservation of angular momentum that's holding you aloft. Holding you aloft. Here's a thought question. Can anybody see how the conservation of angular momentum applies to a planet going around the sun? This might be asking too much of you, but let's give it a shot. What does that conservation of angular momentum have to do with equal areas and equal times? Anyone think they can explain that touchy-feely like? The planet has a mass m. At any moment through time, it has a velocity v. And its radius is between the planet and the star. What happens to the radius when it approaches perihelion? It decreases. So if we're going to conserve angular momentum, mass times velocity times radius, Mateus, we obviously cannot change the mass, right? That's not allowed. So if the radius is decreasing, what's going to happen to conserve angular momentum? Does it increase? Uh, what? What is it? The momentum? No, 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 no. The angular momentum, remember, it's a conserved quantity. 
So the angular momentum has to stay fixed. This is the whole point. No matter what, the total angular momentum, mass times velocity times radius, has to stay fixed. Sorry, I can't really draw with this thing. So the momentum does not increase. It's constant. But the radius is decreasing. The mass stays the same. So let's think about this. What has to happen, Mateus? Anyone understand what I'm saying here? Velocity has to change. Well, how will the velocity change? If, okay, so you have M R V. If the radius is going down, but the total momentum has to stay constant, what's the velocity gonna do? Is it gonna increase? increase? Yeah, so that it will balance the decrease in radius and keep angling. And what happens, the planet travels really, really fast at perihelion, right? But now out here, its moment arm, its radius of orbit gets really, really long. What happens? The velocity slows down a whole bunch. Let's clear the drawings and watch that animation again. This is a crappy animation, but you can see it going really fast and then slower. Um, one of the reasons, for instance, Halley's Comet only comes around 76 years is it only spends about two or three months near perihelion but as Halley's Comet goes way the hell out past the orbit of Neptune, it just starts to go so slow that it spends almost 100 years out there before coming back again. So there, it, these comets just whip by the sun and then they kind of peter out as they're out there at the edge of the solar system. Cool, Newton could see into the machinery of Kepler's laws and realize that there were fundamental things at work like angular, by the way, one of the reasons I had this kid's break is the conservation of angular momentum is so important in astronomy. It's why the solar system flattened into a disk. It's why galaxies flatten into disks and spin. Everywhere you look in outer space, you see things that are rotating around each other in disks because angular momentum must be conserved in the universe. And you get deep insight into things by, by considering that. Okay, boy, have I been wasting this day. Uh, time for the last kahuna. And this is where I want to get to. It's part of our lab today. Let's talk about Newton's version of Kepler's third law. I know I already did this. I want to do it again, OK? Let's do some good remembering here, because I can't stress this enough. How does Kepler's law go, Kepler's third? The harmonic law? Yeah, the harmonic law. It's P squared equals A cubed. P is the period, A is the distance. Tell me about the units. That's what I care about right now. P is in years, A is in AU. And when can I use this formula? In what circumstances does P squared equals A cubed work? When you're trying to find the orbital period? Is that what you're talking about? Obvi, but you can't find any orbital period with this. You can't find the period of the moons of Jupiter. You can't find the period of the moon. You can't find the period of two binary stars with this. You can only find the period of... You need to know this. I can't remember. This matters. Yeah. Pardon? I can't remember. Well, the period of the know. orbit? I'm sorry, Mateus? Is it the period of the orbit? Well, yes, obviously we would like to know that, but you can't find any orbital period with this. You can only find certain ones. Okay, so it works for planets and comets. So in other words, what do those things have in common? What are they orbiting? For things that orbit around the sun. That's the important part. This is only for uh, orbits around the sun. Okay, I can't lie. You can use this for the sun or a star of equal mass. Actually, it could be a dump truck of equal mass. Anything that has the mass of the sun, you can find a period around it. You're not finding the period of the sun, you're finding the period of things that orbit the sun or a star of equal mass. But I almost don't even want to tell you that because I don't want to muddle the message, OK? Forget about that. Only for things that orbit the sun, planets and comets and asteroids and spaceships. 
However, this is astronomy 1020. We want to talk about the whole galaxy in this class, right? So we can't just be relying on this. We need Newton's version. I call it NK3, Newton's version of Kepler's third law. P squared is equal to 4 pi squared a cubed divided by g times the sum of the two orbital masses. I would remind you that the period must always be measured in seconds, the masses in kilograms, and the distance in meters. That's not a small point. That's an important point. It looks like it's a little out of focus here. Can I, is my, what's going on? Dude, it's snowing way too much. Are you talking to me? Oh, I think he was talking to someone else. Does meters look out of focus to you guys? It looks out of focus to me. What is, my, Only a more so bit. the glare for me, not so much being out of focus. But it's only when you step in front of the board, though, when it yeah, because what ties it's, to, it's against your jacket contrast. So I'm a big black blob, and that's a big white blob, so it messes up the contrast. I wonder if I change the focus if that would fix things. Let me. It's hard to like use this program at the same time. Oh. No. All right, well, oh, that's not helping. Okay, I, I don't want to bog this down here. All right, you'll remember that in our last class, we tried this formula, right? You learned how to punch it into the calculator and you were predictably bad at it. <laughs> we're going to be doing this today in lab, okay? But I have something different to tell you. The, well, the thing that you need to first remember is this doesn't just work for orbits around the sun. This works for any two orbits or any two orbiting bodies for any orbiting bodies or masses. You might actually say to me, well, Brendan, if this works in every case, that only works for objects around the sun. Why the hell did you even mess around with that? Why not just teach me this and be done with it? And the answer is for speed. If you're doing a planet going around the sun, this is a much, much faster calculation than that one, okay? You guys remember, you had many mistakes plugging that into your calculator. NK3, however, is not the point. If you were Galileo or you were any astronomer and you went out to your telescope to observe some orbiting bodies, like let's go back here and let's look at Galileo's notes. Here's Galileo watching moons revolve around Jupiter night after night through his telescope tube. What do you think would be the easiest thing to measure when you watch an orbital body? Do you think it would be easier to measure the period, the masses of the planets and moons? or the distances between them? Which do you suppose is the easiest to measure? Maybe I didn't. Oh yeah, who said that? Was that Sabrina? Who was that? Sabrina. Oh, hey. I'm sorry? It's me, yes. Oh, are you trolling me? I was, my daughter. That's <laughs> my okay. Daughter keeps my daughter keeps bothering me, so. <laughs> well, we don't mind looking at her. We don't mind. <laughs> we don't mind seeing you guys uh, <laughs> scrap it up or whatever you're doing. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> um, um, okay, so yes, Sabrina, the period. You are correct because you know what I would do. I would wait for the planet or the moon to get to its farthest point. I would start my stopwatch and I would mm -hmm. watch it go around and come back. And that's right. So if you think about it, uh, Sabrina. No one actually needs this version of the formula to calculate periods because you would always just measure them at a telescope. The distance is a little bit tricky. You can do it. You have to start by measuring its angular separation, like how many arc seconds apart, and then use the small angle formula, but you can get that. 
The thing that's really hard to measure, the thing that you never really know is the mass. And the whole purpose of NK3 is not to learn this version, it's to learn the version that we're actually gonna be using day to day in this class. And I call it NK3 for mass. NK3 solved for mass. And in this version of the equation, we, we take the M1 and M2 and we place it up top and we take the P squared and we place it down at the bottom. I sometimes call M1 and M2 the total mass of the system. The total mass of the system is the sum of the mass of the planet plus the mass of the moon. And it's equal to four pi squared A cubed over GP squared. This is the version that we actually need. And in some ways, this is the whole reason that you learned a little mini physics lecture is so we could get to this critical formula. Sometimes the, I think the book refers to this as the cosmic balance beam. Because physicists use balance beams to measure mass. A scale measures weight, but a balance beam measures mass. This formula's usefulness is we use it to find the masses of stars. And that's what we're going to be using it for extensively in our class this semester. Okay, this lecture ended up being a little weird. I wanted to do some physics bits and I did teach you some new stuff, but I almost spent this entire class going over stuff that we already talked about last Thursday. I feel a little bad about that, but there was a strong reason for me to do it. You guys really need to know and understand these concepts. For instance, you guys definitely needed a little bit of reviewing about P squared equals A cubed, right? That's actually going to matter to you on the test because you're going to have lots of questions with both P squared equals A cubed and with NK3. For that reason, in today's lab, our entire lab is just dedicated to solving a problem nice and slow using NK3. I wouldn't mind doing one of these problems, but we actually did those in our homework last time. You guys remember how both of our problems, first we found the mass of Earth, and then the second one, we found the combined mass of Pluto and Sharon. I'm gonna leave it there. You can review those in the video if you need to watch that again. And definitely watch that, that's important. Um, do I have any time left? I've got five minutes. There's I one I can't see the bottom. Left. I'm sorry, Andrew? I can't see the bottom. All right. While I talk, let me let Andrew catch up here. Um, <clears throat> class, with the last five minutes, I really have to squeeze off one more little thing. There's one last formula that I need to introduce because we're gonna need it later on in this class. You guys will remember that in our last homework, we didn't finish the very last homework problem. I don't know if you realized that Philemon because you had to go and you said you might end up watching the other video. In the other video, I solved that last problem and we didn't actually get to it because we were so slow in solving the other problems. So Philemon, you might've ended up doing extra work. Um, yeah, I got a little, I think, all those A, B, C, D, and then I realized that stuff was going all differently. So I think I was doing work. We were doing work we shouldn't have. Or I forget what class we're in now. So because there are sometimes slight nuances, the important thing, Philemon, is you solved a bunch of those problems, and I will let you turn that in as long as you got through the whole thing. Did you get through the whole? And I already graded it probably, so you're already fine, right? Yeah, I got through the whole thing. My question is right now, I just jumped on because I'm debating work or not today, so I don't know if I should just click back off, start from the beginning later and just do the whole three hours. Or if I jump in in the lab, am I gonna be too screwed up? No, uh, you will not be, uh, I don't wanna hold you from work, but Philemon, you will not be too screwed up because today we haven't actually done that many practice problems. Okay. And the practice problem that we're gonna do today is very similar or identical to one that we did in homework last time. I just think it's so important that we have to go over it again. So if you followed the homework from last time, you should be able to follow this. Obviously, okay. if you have to go to work, I don't want to hold you from going to work, but the problem today is only going to take about 40 minutes if we're efficient. Okay, yeah, I'm just debating because it's snow, so. Uh... Oh yeah, it's, it's snowing. I can see them flakes coming down. I don't know if you guys can see them here. It's snowing up there. 
All right. Um, it's only going to be 40 minutes, Lab. Yeah, I'm going to try to do this one wicked fast. But I can't do it yet. I need to sh show you one last thing. So I got one last module just put up with me today, guys, OK? Last thing, I'm going to keep this short and sweet. NK3 is probably the most important formula from this whole chapter. That's why it's the subject of today's lab. But there's one other formula that I did not get to include yet. And I'm just going to do it quick and dirty and pretend like it's thorough the escape velocity. This is the last equation that Newton was able to derive using his laws of gravity. So let's just do this. Let's define in our notes the escape velocity of a planet or star. In our class, the escape velocity will have the symbol V subscript ESC. That's velocity of escape, OK? And I want to define it in this way. It's that unique speed, it's a single speed for any planet or star, that unique speed that you need to escape the gravity of a, I'm going to start off by saying planet, but it also very much applies to stars. And we're actually going to use it more for stars than planets in this class. That unique fixed speed you need to escape the gravity of a planet or a star of mass capital M and radius capital R. Because we're short on time, we're going to skip the derivation. I'm just going to tell you the escape velocity. Oh, wait, we should draw a little picture, OK? So the picture that you should have is a circular planet. This is the setup. The planet has a radius R and a mass M. Those are the only things that affect the escape velocity. And then you've got some kind of a rocket ship that's blasting off from the surface. I do have a cool story about how Newton derived this, but I, I just don't have time for it, OK? So let's just learn the formula and practice it. The escape velocity is the square root of 2 times big G times the mass of the planet divided by the radius of the planet. Um, in this formula, we are using MKS units. The mass must be measured in kilograms. The radius must be measured in meters. I want to get to the point with you guys where I can just say MKS units, and you'll, you'll kind of know what that means. As an example, we can very quickly find the escape velocity of Earth And in the interest of time, I'm going to give you the values in MKS units, OK? So the escape velocity of Earth would be the square root of, let's do big G, 7 times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared times the mass of Earth, 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, divided by the radius of Earth. You'll remember we calculated earlier in today's class, after some hijinks, uh, that the radius of Earth was 6.4 million meters. OK, I want to see where your calculator chops are at. Could you guys all try to do that and see if you can get the right answer? We haven't done too much calculating yet today, so take that calculator, punch and crunch. <laughs> Philemon, uh, where's work? Is it far away? Yeah, Barrington. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to. 
Do you have a cool enough boss where you can say, hey, it's snowing out there. I don't think I'm going to make it. My own boss. <laughs> <laughs> so real jerk. Uh, I, I, can, I can name through electric and lap, so I can, I can do this. What'd you oh, say? I can make it through electric and lab. I just have to be there at three, so. I okay. I, can, I, I, I promise you we'll be done before three, okay? I will, I will do my, I wanted to make this an easy day for you guys, but well, you know, best laid plans of mice and men. Anyways, you guys got a number for me or what? And Philemon, of course, I encourage you to go back and watch the rest of this video later. It's very, very good for you to do that. I think I covered some important stuff. You know, you could ask these guys. Um, anyone? Guys, this, this shouldn't take all day. I just, I just need a number. I got 8.1 to times 10 to the ninth. Fudge. Oh. I'm not sure if I, I did it right, but I got. Guys, do you realize I forgot the two? Did anyone notice okay. that? I figured it out. I was, I thought you did it on purpose. Okay. I'm sorry. You know, that's, that's last night's whiskey talking right there. All right. Let's see here. Uh, I deeply apologize. Never, never trust, don't trust me too much, all right? Uh, that's not going to totally affect your answer, but it will a little bit. Just punch it one more time. And please do it fast because Philemon's got a job to do. In fact, I'm having a thought about that. Mia, Amy, Sabrina, um, Mariah, Mateus, uh, Mia. If you round it, it's nine to the nine to the negative fifth power. Nine Mateus, times two is negative. I'm sorry, Mia, that's not correct. We something went wrong. Mateus got it for sure. Do I have to do this with everyone? Who else, What other what other numbers are people getting? I want to know if people are getting it right or getting it wrong. Um, if I round it correctly, it'd be 1.1 .1 to like 10 times to the ninth. No, you're not. I got close to that too. You, no, you guys aren't. Oh my God. Uh, I got to give it to you straight. You're not even reading the number right. The first thing you should do when you see a number is look at the fucking decimal point. You don't just move all the way over from the left. This is a number of order 11,000. Okay. That's not 1.1 .1 times 10 to the nine. That's a look. Look, that number is 11,000 with, you're getting distracted by the numbers. Look where the decimal point is. This number is 11,000. Jeez Louise, guys. We can't be making those mistakes. You have to look at the decimal point. Everyone hold up your hand. Hold up your hand right now. I solemnly swear to look at the decimal point, right? You will never not look at the decimal point again and tell me that this number is 1 billion when I can see the decimal point right there. I will destroy you, okay? I'll have you shaved, neutered, and sterilized, okay? So, all right, so, all right, so, all right, so, wow, I'm totally getting fired. Hey, what are the units here? Sorry, what are the units? Um, meters per second. Nice, Andrew. It's a velocity in MKS units. I like your move, son. 11,000 meters per second. Uh, by the way, that's the same as 11 kilometers per second. OK, look, that's all the time that I have for today. That's a, that's, by the way, any object that travels at 11 kilometers per second can leave the gravity of Earth. See this marker? If I could flick this marker at 11 kilometers per second, pew, it would shoot up into outer space. Is 11 kilometers per second fast? What do you think? 
Yes, Mateus, very fast. That, for instance, Mateus, if we were to convert that to miles per hour, 11 kilometers per second to MPH, we're talking 25,000 miles per hour. So if you could just get in your truck, right, and hit the ramp and, and just launch that truck at 25,000 miles an hour, your truck would fly into outer space. I'm having a big thought here. I'm, I'm feeling kind of juiced up with energy. We only have one problem left to solve. We could take the tea break, but considering that Philemon's got a job to do, and since it's just one problem that we have to do today, how do we feel about just beasting it out and getting done a little bit early? Do you guys think you could handle that or would I break your psychic spirit? No, that sounds good to me. I'm fine with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, do we need to print out a no we that's have to print something thing. out today's problem we don't have to do anything like that right. we're just so uh to answer the question what time is it it's 1 40 on the computer right now it's probably a little bit later on my iphone so i bet we could have this done by like just a little after two o'clock maybe 2 15 at the worst and that would be a little earlier than we normally stop and that would help philemon is everyone cool with that all right it sounds like there's no objections. So let's just do that lab problem and let's be done with it, okay? I will go over to the lab room since that's kind of customary. I thought about doing this on paper today as well. Um, to do today's lab, you will just need a sheet of paper. Uh, it would be really nice if you had a ruler and it would be even nicer if you either had a compass. By the way, I'd like to suggest that you guys invest in a compass for some of our future labs or a circle maker. You could use a roll of tape. Uh, you'll need something bigger than a quarter. I love these things. I get these at the art supply store. And for doing astronomy stuff, having a 20 cent circle maker is great. If not, use a coffee cup lid or something, just anything that's circular and about this size, okay? Uh, let me get my nice graph paper. I'm gonna do this. I love busting out the fancy graph paper. I have a candle, will that work? I think that's gonna be perfect, Kiana, yeah. All right. I just want you guys to make a nice diagram as part of the, uh, as part of the job. So uh, one, one, nice, one nice sheet of paper should do it. And uh, I'm gonna get out my, my lab phone because you know, I kind of like holding the phone over this when I do the labs and I need my calculator and I need a sharpened pencil, that's it. You really don't need much at all for today's lab. <clears throat> Class, this was a problem that we were supposed to do for our homeworks this year. It was bit really close to the problem that was 49F or something, where they said to calculate the period of a shuttle. But let's elaborate on it. Let's make it a little bit more fun. Okay, I'm gonna start by telling you part of today's lesson or lab is just to learn about cool things that happen in space. And if you didn't know this, there is a space station that humans have built that orbits Earth every day. It's called the International Space Station. All I have to do is type ISS into Google and it's the first thing that comes up. And I, I don't know if I've talked about it in this class or another, but it's a collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, um, the, the Russian Science Agency, the Japanese have a module on it. And there are humans that are up inside this thing right now, and they're doing research in physics and astronomy and all kinds of different areas of science, some biology. This is kind of our first steps in humans living in space. So it's a pretty wild enterprise. And man, could you imagine being 
one of the people lucky enough to, to be able to go and live on this thing. If you're ever curious about this, um, I think it's Chris Hatfield. Um, he does like a whole tutorial or YouTube videos on how to do everyday ordinary things in space. I love this one, how to make a peanut butter and honey sandwich. So in space, you're almost, there's almost no gravity. They call it microgravity. You're kind of in a state of free fall. So you can see inside the module here, uh, he, he just talks about how to do, oops, everyday things like how to make a sandwich. I'm gonna mute the video. But notice that everything floating around him is, is in a state of microgravity. They're in a state of free fall. So, you know, it, it must be a completely wild experience to live on this thing and just try to do everyday life stuff. You're sleeping in, in, in a zero G environment. There's your tortilla chip. Let's see if he lets it go. The, they have to use Velcro to tie everything down. Some of these videos are cooler than others. I don't know. Anyways, my only point is if you want to know more about it, check out some of those videos. They're pretty dope. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but you can actually see the ISS fly overhead, not exactly every night, but every few nights, usually if there's a clear sky, you might get a chance to see the ISS. Show of hands, has anyone seen the ISS go overhead before? I just want to know if this is something you guys already knew about. Well, doesn't it kind of blow your mind that you can just look up at night and see this? I, I mean, wouldn't you like to know how to do that? It's, it's amazing. It's it's a bright star that just hauls butt across the sky. Our goal today is going to be to calculate the period of the ISS. Because the ISS orbits Earth and not the moon, uh, sorry, and not the sun, it's a perfect place for us to test out Newton's version of Kepler's third law. And that will be today's lab. So without further ado, Our goal today is to find the period of the ISS using Newton's version of Kepler's third law. Share it to iPad or to iPhone. Okay, uh, in yesterday's lab, things went awry. So I need to power this off. Sorry about the delay, guys. Power it back on. That usually resets the mechanism. This is lab number four. We're going to put that on our papers. OK, let's try that one more time. Share screen. Hopefully this fixes it. Uh, damn it. What the hell is going on? Sorry, guys, I'm having technology issues here today. Oh, this thing is driving me nuts. Let me try it one more time here. There we go. Jumping, Jesus. I think it had to take him. All right. Oh, geez. Okay. Sorry, guys. This kind of stuff happens all the time. So um, as usual, I want you guys to follow along with me. Start by putting your name. Okay. This is lab number four. As I mentioned during class today, please turn this into lab four. Do not turn this into lab five or something wacky, okay? You gotta make sure you're submitting to the right thing. Okay. Um, this is AS 1020, and you guys need to put your section there, whether it's 001, 002 or 102. Okay, so today's lab is finding the period of the 
International Space Station, otherwise known as the ISS. Can everyone see okay here? All right. Yeah. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to attempt to make a sort of diagram of this thing. I'm just going to use a cheesy circle maker. And I think I'm going to pick a circle about that big. I'll leave myself a little bit of headroom here. Uh, I'm going to try to use my crosshairs so that I know exactly where the center is. I kind of want to make a nice snazzy picture. Uh, maybe I can put this in the roll of tape. You guys can just kind of watch me here. So I'm going to make a circle where I identify the crosshairs. Should I do this quick? I want you guys to draw the diagram as well. That's part of doing this lab, OK? I'm going to mark, and I'm going to identify the center of the Earth. And I'm going to draw in its radius. A nice, neat diagram really helps you to see and understand the problem. This is the radius of Earth. That's the mass of Earth. This is the stuff that we need to solve the problem. Let's now draw in the International Space Station. The International Space Station, we'll just draw a little bit overhead, OK? And sometimes when I want to draw a satellite, since I don't have like really awesome art skills, some of you probably do. I kind of just make it look like a little piece of candy. I kind of have a box, and then I put some solar panels on it. I'm sure some people could make a nicer space station, but that's mine. All right. Um, the ISS also has a mass. Let's see if we can put some numbers in. Uh, the mass of the ISS is I think it's 400 metric tons. And a, a metric ton is 1,000 kilograms. So the mass of the ISS is 400,000 kilograms. The height the ISS orbits above Earth, 400 kilometers, approximately. The radius of the Earth, where is she? Is Kiana still with us? Or yeah, yeah Kiana, we're here. what's the radius of the Earth? It is. Oh my God, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Is it? Oh God, is it six times x to the twenty-fourth, or did I no, no, the wrong that's one? the massive Earth. Oh, that's the mass, my bad. Oh, yeah. Mass. Six times 10 to the 24. Yeah, kilogram. All right. You always have to give me units. And the radius of Earth, I was just testing if you could read the number. That's all I was doing. Remember we had this issue earlier today? Yeah. All right, so do me proud here. What's the radius of Earth? How do I say that? <laughs> 6,400 kilometers. Good. All right. Okay. Now let's write down NK3. So because the satellite is orbiting Earth and we're trying to find its period, um, we, can, we have to use the legendary NK3 formula. This one, we're using the original version to solve for periods. So <clears throat> P squared, the period of the satellite squared, is equal to four times pi squared times a cubed over big G times, okay, what are the two masses in this case? The mass of the earth and the mass of the ISS. You guys with me so far? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
anytime you solve one of these problems, you've got two jobs before you begin. First, we want to solve for the period. We have to make sure we know what all of these letters mean and know what they are. And then we have to worry about their units. So we know four, that's cool. We know pi, that's cool. We also know big G, because as Mateus discovered today, big G always has the same number in every scenario. Seven times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared. And that's what we learned today. Big G, we always know that. And that will be on a formula sheet that I give you during the test. We have to worry about what is A and what are the masses. It looks like we have the masses. What do you think A is in this case, students? Would it be the kilometers? Yeah, well, <laughs> sort of, but what kilometers? Kilometers. Oh, my bad. Would it be the 400 one? Ah, uh, but remember, when we consider orbits, Kiana, the satellite doesn't orbit the surface of Earth, yes. right? Yes. It orbits the center of Earth. So. So that it's the 6,400 kilometers. But. The satellite is a significant distance above the Earth. This isn't like the four meter apple tree. This is 400 kilometers. Yeah. So what should I do now then? If I, it's almost like I have to consider both of them. So. Would we it, add them or is it even worth yeah, adding them? Yeah, it, it, uh, in this case, I think it is worth adding them because, well, what percentage? 400 divided by 6,400. It's 6%, which your answer wouldn't be affected too, too much, but I still think it's worth adding them. So let's make a note of this because Kiana just learned something. The orbital radius A is this distance. See, because here, Kiana, the radius of Earth is pretty significant, but the 400 kilometers is kind of significant. So here we have to do 6,400 kilometers plus 400 kilometers. So the A is equal to 6,800 kilometers. Are those the proper units for A? They need to be converted to meters. Who said that? Mariah. Great. Mariah, that's a you job then. Oh, great. <laughs> you like that? You, like how you just volunteered yourself there? Yeah, um, I can do it though. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can get through it, Mariah. We have to do it on the test, so at yeah. least I can help you, right? Yeah, okay. So is it, whew, okay, I'm ready. Is it 6.8 times 10 to the fifth? No. Damn um, it. <laughs> no, but could we do the steps of dimensional analysis? Yeah. I think that's the right way to do this here. Yeah. So then it's um, 6,800 kilometers times um, the division bar with 1,000 meters the, on the top. Mariah, you're giving, me yeah. the bloody, you're giving me the willies, OK? The willies? You're giving me the willies. Yeah, I, I think we should put the units in first before the numbers. OK, so then meters on top, kilometers on bottom. Fine. I'm glad if that was so easy, then just humor, humor a grouchy old man, okay? <laughs> so meters on top and kilometers on bottom. That takes care of killing kilometers. Now you can give me the numbers, okay? Okay, so then a thousand um, meters on top and then one kilometer at the bottom. All right, let's do this in our head. Our decimal point is over here, right? Mm -hmm. One, two, three. What did we learn? Oh, that's six. So tell me the final number. So it's then 6.8 times 10 to the six. What? Um, meters. Okay. Good. Now our A is looking good. Mm -hmm. 
Now we got to deal with the masses. The total mass of the system is mass of Earth plus the mass of ISS, six times 10 to the 24 kilograms plus 400,000 kilograms. Could you guys add those up, please? Mm -hmm. And I do mean add, please don't hit the times bar. I just hit the I just hit the time. Six. I got six um and six times ten to twenty-four. I think I don't know if I did that right. I got that too. But wait a minute, wasn't that just the mass of Earth? No. I suppose you were you were supposed to add the mass of the ISS to that. Six times ten to the twenty-four is just the mass of Earth. So how is how is that possible? I don't know. Hold on. Huh. Maybe we did it wrong or something? It's ESP 24 plus. Mass. Yeah. What, what are you saying, Mia? I'm keeping the same thing. I'm Mia, do you, you understand the joke that I'm playing on these guys? That's the same oh, yeah. oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, so what's up with that? I don't know. You don't? So, oh, I you want, does I know this happened last time in a problem, but I forgot how it happened. Like, doesn't it cancel out? or something or it's not that it cancels out is that kelly that i heard there yeah so kelly this is important we want to this is a detail i desperately want you guys to remember that's why i'm being so dramatic about it but i here's the problem you typed in six exp 24 plus 400 kilograms yes. and you got six times 10 to the 24 kilograms and it's like Maybe the mass is so small that it doesn't even apply. Oh, right. Yeah, that's the idea, right? This is yeah. like taking 10 bazillion dollars and yeah. adding one penny to it. 10 okay. bazillion plus one penny is 10 bazillion dollars, right? Yeah. This, this is 24 zeros, right? This is only one, two, three, four, five zeros. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So in other words, the shuttle, the mass of a, even though the ISS is, you know, more massive than a car, it's tiny in comparison to the Earth, and you can actually neglect the mass of the shuttle. Now, I want you guys to notice what would happen. Here, we, 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 ne we couldn't neglect the mass of the, sh of the height, sorry, we didn't neglect the height of the shuttle because 400 kilometers is a pretty, well, it's a small but reasonable chunk of 6,400 kilometers. But here, 6 times 10 to the 24, Students never really understand this in my class until it's too late. This is the number. That's not the number. That's the number, the power of 10, right? In other words, the total mass of the system is essentially just the mass of Earth. That's it, okay? Now, we're ready to play the game. When I write this down, rather than writing P squared, I'm gonna put the square on the other side and turn it into a square root. So right after me, P, the period of the ISS, make a nice big neat square root. Here, I gotta go hands-free for a second. Put a division bar inside there. We're gonna need some room. Okay, so we got four times pi squared. I'll just leave that as is four times pi squared times the a cubed. Who's been paying attention? What do I put in for a cubed? 6.8 times 10 to the sixth. I want you to write it like me. Open parentheses, 6.8 times 10 to the six meters, close parentheses cubed. <coughs> Remember the... Uh, <coughs> Parentheses are for the meters, not for the calculator. Divide by big G. 
Mateus knows is always seven times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared. And here, instead of the total mass, we, we neglected the mass of the ISS. So it's just the mass of Earth. Notice that when I write out my equation, do you see how neat and organized this is? I keep my units in there. I want you guys to copy me. I want you to start doing things the way I do them. I've been doing this a long time. There's a reason I set things up like this. I keep all my units in there. Okay. I trained you on how to do this before. I want to see who remembers how. Now it's time for you guys to give this a whack. Okay. Try to stand that up. See what you can do. I will, of course, punch you through it, but I really think it's a good exercise. And if you're watching the video at home later, please, for the love of God, punch this stuff in. You can't learn how to do it unless you punch it with your own fingers. So Philemon, I hope when you were watching those videos later that you were, you were punching. Yes. Yes. Even if you weren't, you know that you have to say yes or I'm gonna go ballistic. Uh, <laughs> remember Philemon, one of the reasons why I offer these live sessions besides the recordings is to kind of force you guys to punch. I hope you've got your calculator there, buddy. I got it. All right. Well, let's see what you got. Uh, let me look at that, Kiana. Uh, nope. I figured it wasn't right. Matt, Mateus got it. Mia, can you, uh, Mattia, nope. Mariah, nope. Andy, I'd like, uh, Nick, nope. I can't figure out what I keep doing wrong whenever I do these problems. Like, I swear it's just one small thing that I'm doing wrong that's like throwing it's it off. Other things, I think, well, I'm gonna punch it through with you because I expected that you guys would still be struggling. That's why we're doing this, right? One of the main issues is you can't hit times here you have to hit divide. Also, you can't forget your cube. Also, you have to hit equals and then square root. Uh, Tegan, can, I can't see what you got there, buddy. Is You're backlit by a window. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's, Raya, um, you sorry. got it. What'd you get, Tegan? Um, I got 2.9 um, to the negative point. Yeah, that's not right. <clears throat> hey, Mariah, what's that number that you got? You remember your solemn promise to me, right? Yeah, I do. Sorry, Andrew. Okay. Sorry, so, Mia. What is it? Sorry, Philemon. Okay, do you guys see why it's so important for us to practice this? Had this been the test, you would have gotten the answer wrong. Most of you would have. And I don't want that. I want you guys to get the answer right. The reality is, Kiana, you're gonna keep forgetting. That's why we have to keep doing it. Mariah though, I wanna see if Mariah can handle round. I wanna see if Mariah even knows what the hell she's looking at. That's what I'm curious about. She got the right answer, but that doesn't mean she knows how to interpret it. I know, I know. Okay. What is that number? Okay, so if I'm doing this correctly, I think it would be, it would be like five thousand, maybe four hundred. You it, are on fire today, Mariah. That's oh, right. Thank God. But what are the? <laughs> wait a second. Wait a second. What are the units? I'm okay, so, so proud of you. I was you. trying to cancel everything out, and the last thing I found was seconds. That's right. Because oh my God, I'm so smart. Wow, you are. You are killing this today, girl. You go. 5,400 seconds. Okay. I bet a lot of people out there want to see how she got that. Is that correct? 
Do you want to yeah. punch it with me? All right. Yeah. yeah. You, there are so many guys. There are so many test questions about this problem. You have mm -hmm. to be able to get this. Okay. I just want to say congratulations, Mariah. You impressed me three different times just now. First of all, you got the right answer, which I was impressed. Second of all, you rounded it and figured out how to like say it correctly. That impressed me. And even more impressive, you also knew what the units were through canceling them out. Also, it's a period, so it better have units of time, right? Yeah. yeah. And it better be MKS units. Anyway, okay. Thank right. you. For the, rest, for the rest of you guys, it's time to party. I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna try to do it slow, but keep up with me, okay? Uh, let me talk about strategies. We're gonna do this times that squared times that cubed. We're gonna divide by this. We're gonna divide by that equals and then square root. All right. So four times pi squared times 6.8 exp6. Now we got to cube that. Remember that the cube key is here in orange. So we have to do shift and then this key to cube it. Now we are going to divide by 7 exp negative 11. And most critical, when we get there, we're going to hit divide, divide by 6 exp 24. Was times 6 at exp 24? No. It, did, did, I hit, did I hit times? I don't know. I, it kind of slowed down. Yeah, oh. you said this is the most important that part, and then you cut out, and then you said the last bit of it. Sorry, it said my internet connection was unstable for a second. When you get here, you have to hit divide by yeah, six okay. exp 24. So I did divided by six exp 24. Boy, what a terrible time for my internet to crash. I know, <laughs> right? That was right. Like, like the most important thing. Okay, now I'm gonna hit- All right, so- No, wait, hold on, we're not done yet. Now I'm gonna hit equals. I noticed a few of you had this number. You know what you forgot to do? You forgot to square root it. I forgot that too. Shift, square root. Okay. And there is Mariah's 5,400 seconds, not 5.4. The decimal point is there. All of these numbers are garbage. Even the three and the six are garbage. 5,400 is real. So my question is, so it's six. Could what? you guys all hold up your calculator demonstrating to me that you did this right? Okay, so I'm gonna wait. be honest, I didn't get it because I, I got that glitched question. out. I hit the wrong button. So okay. my end's um, not right because it of that. It got a little laggy. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Kiana, we're gonna do it one more time then. I'm liking okay. Kelly's. Oh, I finally see Kelly's face. I didn't really see your face, but I see your calculator. Wait, so okay, is it Kelly? Nice is moves. It, is Eclipsing it, yourself. Yes, yes, Philemon. Yes, Kelly. Yes, Sabrina. Uh, it looked like everyone else. Nick, you got it too, right? Oh, really? I got messed up on when it lagged a little bit, and then I missed right. a number. Let's do it one more time. Can I go faster this time? Yeah. Wait, I got a question. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, so is it uh, two to the second and then shift? Where do you with see the, uh, two, two, With the pi? I don't see. No, you just, look, Andrew, just follow with me, OK? Mm -hmm. All right. Four times pi squared times 6.8 exp6 shift cubed divided by 7 exp minus 11 divided by 6 exp24 equals shift square root. OK, I got it now. Awesome. That's and a lot of remember. Sheesh. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Wait, say that again? That's a lot to remember. I keep getting confused with the pies and the squares sometimes. So it's like, 
the heck? Guys, I think what I'm gonna have to do is write down like how exactly you're supposed to type. I think that's the only way I'm gonna remember is if like I write down step by step how to do it. Can I tell you how you're gonna remember another way? Yes, and please. Mateus, notice Mateus got it because he was in the same boat as you guys last semester. Oh. The way you get it is by just punching it over and, wait, over, and wait, over again. It's like wait. learning how to play chopsticks on the piano. You just have to keep going at it, all right? So is it four times EXP X to the second times 6.8 EXP six shift? Oh, so there's no division? No, there is I think division. I'm dividing. Well, I you think gotta, you, when you it comes up to there. Divide, right? You yeah. kind of, you have to cube it before you divide. There is definitely division, Andy. I would not say that. All right. I mean, look, this is how I do it when I'm doing it. Four times pi squared times 6.8 exp6 cubed divided by but, seven it, exp it's it's too slow divided processing. by exp20. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. so, all right. I, but you can get this fast, OK? So four times pi squared times 6.8 exp6 cubed divided by seven exp minus 11 divided by six exp24 equals shift square root. That's how fast I want you to be, all right? Yeah, that's how fast I want to be too. All right, yeah, I mean, you will be that fast. You one will day. be that fast if you keep- At the end of the semester. All right. <laughs> yeah, actually what happens is by the time you guys are really good and well-trained, then you leave me and I have to start over and again. Then we, don't, then we don't remember- I'm still not getting that number right. for some reason. Uh, okay, so just punch with me, Andy, one more time. Four, I want you to say it out loud as I say it. So four, say four. Four times times pi pi squared uh, x two okay times times six point eight six point eight exp six exp six shift cube shift cube divide by Divide seven exp exp negative eleven negative eleven divide by divide by six exp twenty four exp twenty four equals equals shift square root. Oh, it's shift and then square root? OK. Because yeah, it's an orange. Did you get it now? So it's equals equals shift um, shift. What is it? X2? Yeah, you have to hit shift first so that you activate the square root. Oh, yeah, I got it now. Yay. I just didn't do the shift X2. Okay. Guys, anyone can get this. You just have to beast it a few times, okay? So it's all cool. Now, I got one last little task or two last little things for us to do, and then I'll let Philemon get to work here. How am I doing on time? Did I deliver I promised? It's 2.15. All right, 5,400 seconds is a little bit abstract. Why don't we convert this to like minutes or something? Mia Femino, you're my pal. Help me use dimensional analysis to convert that to minutes. Okay. This isn't going to be fun. Okay, good. <laughs> What's the first step? Uh, put in the division bar. That's step two. Then. The first the step here is write down the number to convert with its units. So I don't have any room over there. So I'm going to write 5,400 seconds. Times step the division bar. Okay. And we want this to. What do you want this to again? Let's try minutes for starters. Okay. You want seconds on the bottom, minutes on the top. Good. Cross out the seconds. And now? So then, 60, uh, one on the top and 60 on the bottom. Excellent. And this tells me that I've got to take this and divide it by 60. That's what the message is. So we'll do 5,400 divided by 60. How many hours is that? Two. Oh, 90 minutes. Oh, that's um, 
hour, an hour and a half, an yes. hour and 10 minutes. That's how long it takes the International Space Station to go around the entire Earth. That's fast. Wow, right? right? That's faster than it takes to drive to New York City than <laughs> the entire Earth in 1.5 hours. Okay. Now look, I'm gonna show you one last thing before we end, but does everyone see this? This is the final product that you will turn into me. Oh, put a box around it, because that's a classy move. That's fast. That's really fast. Really, really, really fast. This is your final product. This is what you will turn into me. Now I'm going to show you one last thing before we end. I just, I'm, once I stop the sharing of the phone, I won't be able to get back to it. So has everyone got everything they need? Okay, cool. All right. Do you want us to write what you're about to show us? No. Uh, every time we do a little project like this, I like to end on a happy note, <laughs> not the calculation punch. And I, I want to just like tie it all together and make you guys think about things while this is cool. Um, and I just want to show you something cool you might not have known about. Um, uh, you can't quite see the ISS every hour and a half because if you think about it, guys, it takes 24 hours for the Earth to spin. So the ISS is in a polar orbit. It's going north to south around the Earth. But you kind of have to wait for Rhode Island to spin underneath the ISS. And the, the last two things that I wanted to show you were, um, if I share screen to computer, I just wanted to show you a couple of just two little quick things, very, very fast. Um, one is there's a website run by the European Space Agency. Where is the ISS? And you can actually, um, you can actually just live track where it is. And they even have video from the ISS too, which is pretty dope. Uh, we should even be able to see like today's snowstorm over the East Coast if we're lucky. Oh, look at this. Currently, the ISS is going over Oregon. And in the next, uh, you know, maybe 20 minutes or so, it's going to pass above Canada. And it's probably going to come close to, to being over our sky. So it'll, in, it looks like an hour ago, it was over the Great Lakes. An hour and a half ago, it was over the Great Lakes. And an hour and a half from now, it'll be back over here. I don't know. They're showing the orbit, but you can see where it is. And it'll even help you figure out whether you'll be able to see it from, from your sky tonight. A couple other cool things. Um, in the ISS, they have something called the ISS Capola. It's like an observation window that you can look out on Earth. And you have to imagine how amazing it would be if you could uh, get a trip to the ISS and you could just spend time like, like these astronauts do, hanging out. Let's just find a, uh, one of these pictures is really charismatic here. You can see. All right, here's uh, one of our, our astronauts just kind of relaxing on some time off and just looking through the window and staring down at Earth as it rotates underneath you. Could you imagine anything so majestic and beautiful as just watching the entire globe of Earth rotate underneath you? How mind-bogglingly crazy that would be? Uh, one of my students reminded me that they do, um, uh, I think on YouTube, they do uh, a live stream of the ISS from the Coppola. I think they do, uh, shoot, I did something wrong here. No. I'm going to YouTube and then type it in. Yeah, you're right. I need you whippersnappers to help me. All right. Uh, Sorry, some of the little windows that I use to run Zoom are blocking me. ISS live stream. Uh, so I think they're constantly showing you, yeah, this is what's happening now. So, oh, they're, cool. Sometimes if they're doing a spacewalk, they'll show you the astronauts like engaged. Right now, the guy is up there dangling above the earth here on a spacewalk. But I want to show you one other one that I really love. Um, and, and this is just the, you know, the very last thing. Uh, there is there is a, a YouTube site. Sorry, it's probably glitching out a little bit because I'm doing this over the internet. But it's called YouTube Orbit a Journey in, in Real Time. 
and it's in 4K, they do a complete orbit of the International Space Station in 4K resolution. Now, I recently treated myself uh, to a 4K projector. And so sometimes when friends come over, I'll just like put this on in the background while we're having a cocktail or eating a sandwich or something. And it's just so beautiful to watch, to watch a complete rotation of Earth and the detail is like so high res. Sometimes we'll play a little game. Or we'll, we'll try to look at the topography and like, like what, part, what part of Earth are we over? Like, looks like we're over the Middle East somewhere. It's some desert terrain. And we'll try to figure out, okay, what desert is that? Or what river is that? And we'll kind of like play the geography game. It turns out that I suck at that game. And many of my friends are much better at it than I am. But I it's probably kinda, would too. <laughs> well, but it's a cool thing to challenge yourself. Like, could I recognize what these mountains are? Also, they're just so beautiful. You know what's really cool? Like, for instance... I've seen this one a few times, so I'm pretty sure that's the that's the Red Sea there that they're going over. Um, what's really cool is when that goes into nighttime, when they go to the nighttime side of Earth, it's just so beautiful to see all of the cities stretched out across the desert. You really get a sense that human beings are kind of like this cyborg virus that's infesting the surface of our planet. One of the cool questions the book asked in one of the um, sample problems that I thought about assigning to you guys is they wanted you to base off the height of the ISS, try to figure out what the smallest detail you'd be able to see with your naked eye is. And it turns out that you can't even really see the Great Wall of China that well from the cupola of the ISS. So they asked this really beautiful follow-up question where, which was, is there anything you can think of that would point to the fact that there were intelligent aliens living on this planet if you had come from somewhere else? And after you scratch your head for a few minutes, you realize, oh shit, if I went to the nighttime side of the planet, I would see all of the electricity and the lights. That's what it would tell me that this was an inhabited planet. So that's kind of a cool idea because if we ever did get to travel in a spacecraft to an alien planet, by day, it would not be obvious to our eyes that there was any type of civilization there because it's hard to see the individual cities. But as soon as nighttime hits, you see the electricity glowing in the dark, right? And that's, that's pretty cool. Anyways, I thought that would be just, you know, a nice philosophical way to end that uh, session. Um, thanks once again for playing lab and thanks guys for pushing through the break. I, I think that helped Philemon. I, I went a little bit over. I always do Philemon. I always tr tr trick you a little bit, but you'll certainly get to work before three, won't you? Yeah, it's 228 right now. Oh, 229. All right. You can um, make um, I just wanted to say one thing, professor. So I don't know if you remember last class I mentioned to you, um, or we talked about how when I uploaded the picture onto Blackboard, it came out as a JPEG. Well, I found this app, it's called Adobe Scanner, and okay. you can still take a picture of your work from your phone and you can just turn it into a PDF file and still upload it to Blackboard, not as a JPEG. It'll just be a different file as a PDF. So you really don't have to do anything different. That's great. And so Adobe, it's Adobe Scanner. Um, when you Adobe upload it from your yeah. phone, does it show up in the preview box then? Yep. So you have to go like when I ask you where you want to get the file from, like from from your phone, you have to um, it'll show up. Well, is it free see. program Adobe Scanner? Is it's it free? free. Yeah, you can get it on the App Store. I, I, I have an Android. I got it on Google Place, but I would imagine they have it on um, the Apple it. Store, too. Yeah. OK, cool. So that's Nick, a really helpful piece of advice. I wrote it down here. Yeah. And I'll try to like spread the word to all the other students in my classes. Use yeah. because that way the it was so it just, easy. It, it changed the game, right? Did it change? Yeah, the totally changed the game because you you don't even have, you can just take it from your gallery and then put it onto the Adobe Scanner, and it's just it's just oh. super easy. So I would suggest anybody that's having like a hard time, definitely like just go um, tinker with it. It's super easy, dude. Thank you so much. You can't know how how helpful that is to so many of my students. So. Uh, the, the people in this class will get the word through the video and I'll tell my 1010 students, Adobe Scanner, I will not forget that. That way it's easy for you and it's easy for me. Yeah. Okay, guys, um, enjoy your snow and uh, I will see you on Thursday, right? Uh, I don't know, we're gonna have like a, we're gonna have to push ahead with the homework. It's gonna be a little weird, but I'll see what we can do. So Thursday, we'll party some more. We'll learn some more science. Um, have fun until then. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.